you are reaching your audience, right? You create that brand affinity. But how exactly you justify the whole project? Hello and welcome to this episode of the Confessions of a B2B Marketer podcast. I know you're going to love this episode. It's really one of the reasons why I'm in marketing in the first place. It's these small, like niche strategies that enable a tiny, super engaged, excited niche to jump in, collaborate, give their opinion about something, and then use that to leverage and get attention for your brand. Like everybody out there in the world is interested in something. So even if you think your product is in a super boring niche, like safety technology, like we're about to dig into, people that work in safety, like safety managers, spend eight hours a day at their job doing their thing. They get interested in it because that's human nature. And then they can't, they have no one else to talk to about this apart from other safety managers, and maybe they don't know many of them. And so when they can meet and engage with other safety managers, that creates typically or can create content if it's done on the internet. And then if your brand owns that content, then you're going to get awareness very cheap. And so that's what we're going to be digging into on this LinkedIn page strategy with Mikhail of Slice. Let's jump into that chat right now. Mikhail, thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Tom. So we met on LinkedIn like two weeks ago, is that right? Sounds about right. Because of a very insightful LinkedIn comment you left on my post about LinkedIn ads. Yeah, that's right. We do run a lot of ads related to our company page. Mm -hmm. Which is what I wanted to dig into first. But I think it's good to give the audience a bit of context, like you and Slice, just so people understand where this valuable knowledge is coming from. Okay, yeah. I run B2B marketing for a company called Slice, which is industrial manufacturer. So not a SaaS company. I think it's worth pointing out because SaaS seems to be everywhere. And some people even assume that B2B is the same thing as SaaS. So we sell physical products to many, many different big companies. So basically the same thing, but there are certain aspects that make this type of business look very different from SaaS. But in any case, it's B2B, long sales cycles and complex journeys, all these things like uh, buyer committees, all that stuff applies. Got it. Yeah. And uh, LinkedIn is a big, big, big part of our marketing and company page is also plays a key role in our marketing. Which is exactly what I want to do this episode. I want it to be like the go-to resource for anybody who's looking to use the LinkedIn company page, not personal page, in order to grow or like help with their B2B marketing. So can I first like come at you with an objection as to why maybe you wouldn't want to do anything with a company page? Go ahead. <laughs> so I think the obvious objection that I think most people listening will be aware of is the lack of reach on organic posts from company page versus personal page. Yeah. I think this objection is coming from not the correct use of company pages as a tool on LinkedIn. There is a key difference between personal pages and company pages as I see it. And the key difference is that company posts can be promoted so you can pay money. So that's a business, right? So you run marketing, you have money to spend, your budget. So use it. This confusion between applying the same approach and to promoting personal brands and company page, it doesn't work. Yeah, you can't look at company pages exactly the same way as your personal brand or personal pages and apply exactly the same technique. And then, oh, it doesn't work. And then people would use different justification as to why they don't want to proceed. They would say things like, well, people like to buy from people and they lean towards, they double down on personal brands and things like that, which I think it's just not a lot of people figured out how to properly use company pages. But I would ask like, okay, personal brands are great, but they also present risk to a business because shocking news are people leave companies. What are you going to do? Like if you create this dependency that a lot of your marketing, a lot of inbound that you get through personal brands, you create this dependency on personal brands and then people leave, 
what are you going to do? Can you just that easily replace it? And the big difference, the big advantage of a company page that you create an asset that belongs to a business. And if I leave, nothing is going to break at Slice. Assuming you've documented everything you're doing properly. But yeah, that's, you threw back at me a very valid objection, actually, that I wasn't really considering. But if we can zoom out then, and I would love for you to break down the strategy that you've used, because in the comment that you put on my post, you said that the LinkedIn page has grown 2K to 8K followers in eight months. So I'd love to know content, how much paid we're doing, posting schedule. Okay, so I'll just start probably where I started. I started with just trying to figure out what, how I want to shift marketing because things were stagnating and I knew something has to change. I was looking on LinkedIn, consuming different information. And I came across this notorious term, B2B media company for B2B marketing. I know that a lot of people don't like it. I liked it. I didn't know what that means what this term mean. That was fine by me because I was just intrigued by it. I was like, there is something to it. And what it did for me, it just prompted some thought process inside my head. And I probably took a few months to I just thinking about it. I wasn't in a rush. And eventually I created a process at Slice that propelled our company page to where we are now from being a standard company page where we would occasionally share a link to a blog post, the usual stuff. So basically, we started experimenting with content. And that content that we posted on our company page was in a form of pictures where we would have a question that I knew that our target audience, it was very relevant to them because they were like conversations there was debates around such, around these questions. And I wanted to see what really resonated most with them. And I promoted them. I promoted them using LinkedIn ads. And some of these posts gathered literally hundreds of comments. And so I knew what topics resonated most. Initial insights into the questions I took from interviews. I spoke with some of the not only customers, right? People from our target audience. I didn't really care whether they were customers or not, just people from our target audience. And so the interesting thing about that experiment that lasted over several months was that for me, the discovery that comments under our posts, some of the comments were gathering a lot more engagement than the original post. So somebody from our audience would comment something under our post. And this comment would get 200 engagements. And I was like, wow. And so for me, that was a discovery. People from our audience want to hear from their peers, not from me. They want to hear from their peers. And so we created a show based on this experiment where we first invited those people who commented and their comments created a lot of engagement. We invited them on the show, we interviewed them, and that's where we started to create a content machine production, what they call. We have, we record interviews with experts from our audience. And this is something that most people will be familiar with. We break them down on clips, right? We post them daily on LinkedIn, on our company page. So no personal brands are involved. And we promote each one of them using LinkedIn ads. Now, there are some specifics we need to dive into, like exactly how we do it, because there are certain aspects that matter. Yeah. Can I just jump in? So I understand that now we're getting questions from the interviews with the commenters. They came onto your show and then you get the clips. Initially, where did you get the questions from? Initially, the questions... I got from interviewing, interviewing people from our audience. So we just spoke about different things. And I had a few hypotheses, like what might be interested in them. So I was just trying to talk about their job without mentioning our product, our solution, anything, right? 
because I was trying to figure out what they care about. Yeah. And these people, you just reached out to them, called on LinkedIn and you're like, will you jump on a call with me? Correct. Nice. I would just find somebody from our audience. I know they're from our audience. I would just send them a message like, would you be open for a 30 minutes interview? And here's how I'm going to compensate your time. That's it. And can you just give an example of a question just so there's some context for the audience? Well, so that was about a year ago. So that the questions were specific to our audience. Well, I go on here. What is the Pollyanna effect and how does it affect safety management? Yeah. So in this case, it's already a clip, right? So it's something that we was produced as a result of our further exploration and interviews. But the initial questions were trying to figure out what resonates with the audience. So there were were different questions. Like we would literally like post anything that you would think maybe this would be interesting. And so some of them were about using soft skill or people's skills in your day-to-day job, right? And we see like, how does this resonate, right? And we would look at the reaction. And so we ended up creating a show that was dedicated to using people's skills for our audience. When you say a show, do you mean an episode or like a whole show, a whole podcast? Right, the whole podcast. So what we like, the human side of safety. So our audience is safety managers. And our podcast is dedicated to the human side of, of safety. So we look into things like people skills, psychology, behavioral science, and that kind of stuff. So we don't go to everything. We approach it from a specific point of view. Got it. Makes sense. But let's veer away from the show for now and focus back on the page. Right. So we have, we've done interviews, non-public ones, to understand what the good questions are. We then, are we answering the questions in text posts or video posts, like the initial ones that you promoted? The initial ones were just pictures, which I just created in Canva, like five minutes, basically. It's just a question. I put it in a square image and post it. And then I would uh, $100 behind as ad spend. And it's just the question, it's not the answer. It's just the question. Yes, this is very nice. And just a question, because usually what I see marketers think about thought leadership and you have to educate your audience. But because I was approaching, now let me just step back. One realization that I made even before that is that our solution is only a very small part of what our audience has to deal with on a daily basis. And only small part, like really small, like less than 1%. Like who is going to dedicate their time to something that insignificant? I always like to give an example of a, a social media scheduler for marketers. Like, are you going to spend time to listening to a show dedicated to a product that is a social media scheduler? No, it's only a small part of your job. You don't want to spend time to that. I want you to keep them engaged daily. How can I keep them engaged daily with something that takes only a fraction of their time daily? It's not possible. So I needed to come up with something that is really, that takes their, grabs their attention on a daily basis. That's something that they have to apply all the time at their job. Cool. So something broader like a challenge or a controversial opinion in the world of safety management. Correct. Yes. Got it. Okay. This is super cool. So you're creating that question. Well, like you're working out the question by through the interviews. You're creating the question in Canva. You're then posting that organically to the page, but then you're boosting just a hundred dollars. You're saying, am I right in assuming that the targeting on LinkedIn is going to get you like pretty close to the buyer persona? I assume there's like safety manager job titles you can target. Yeah. So I use job titles as a primary targeting option. And I also specify geography. Mostly it's job title. It's what we use as a primary key targeting option. Got it. It's very simple, but it's very effective. It's very simple. Yes. Now I want to dig into a couple more points around this. One objection that maybe the uh, CEO would give you is that he'd be like, awesome. We're growing the page. We're getting followers who it seems like they could be buyers, but then how are we going to convert these people? That's a really good question. And that's interesting because 
when I started, I didn't know how to do that. I was just trying to do something different. I knew that this is the way because you are reaching your audience, right? You create that brand affinity. But how exactly you justify the whole project? So at some point, now let me state the problem first, how I actually realized that I needed to change something. Now, first clips that we started to promote on our page were getting a lot of attention. People really liked them. And we started to get feedback. The feedback was kind of almost devastating for me because people were saying that, oh, everybody knows slice videos, people would say from our audience, but nobody knows like what Slice does. And I was like, wow, that's marketing nightmare. Like what I'm doing here? Because it's all nice, but you are a business at the end of the day, right? So that I started to think like really hard, like what should I do now? And what I did is at the end of each clip, we added a short video telling exactly what Slice is and what we do and exactly how we help our audience. And we add those clips at the end of every video. And only after that, I realized, so this is what the B2B media company is. We basically create media and then we have ad placements, which we don't need to buy because we're all media, but we still, I am a media company, I am a media buyer, but I buy it at zero dollars. And so this is the justification. In my case, the justification for the CEO is that instead of going to industry publications, industry media, and paying them thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars, we reach the same audience through our own content at zero cost. And on the cost is our production team, right? Plus the, the ad spend initially to go to the followers, right? That, but also if you pay somebody like an industry, a media company from your industry, as with any ad spend, when you stop, you stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in our case, because we own the media, we continuously can reach our audience. For sure. It's like, especially in a time of crisis right now when there is a lot of conversations when marketing budgets getting smaller and smaller and people are cutting on ad spend. In our case, we don't need to do that because we spend zero dollars on ads and we serve ads daily, right? So of course we have budget because we need to go back to how we use paid media on LinkedIn, right? It's not that simple. It still shows how exactly our uh, content strategy works on LinkedIn. Yeah. So I found one of the question posts and I'll just describe it for the listeners. This is a year ago. So in the text of the post, we just say, as a safety manager, how important is it to work directly alongside your employees? I love this. A great question. Then there's about like eight hashtags. Also great, it's going to help with organic reach. Then the image, interestingly, has no slice branding. The header is like workplace safety chat, which I guess is just like the title of this series, right? Then it's the same, exact same text question. And then in the bottom, in smaller text, it says, share your experience in the comments. Now, this has 116 likes, 46 comments, six reposts. I'm just going to read part of one of the answers. Now, this answer got 10 likes. Like so many comments above are mentioned, it's a balancing act. And then the comment goes on for like 100 more words, and that gets 10 likes. And you have people replying to that comment saying, well, relationship building with workers is very important for a safety manager. It's critical for the supervisors. I just love seeing this kind of like, these people obviously love like the world of safety management and you're just giving them a place to like engage and talk about the thing they love. It's such a powerful strategy. I really like it. I have a couple of clarifying questions though. So we can assume here that roughly like $100 was spent to boost this one. I guess you can't remember the exact amount you spent on each image, but it's around, would it be around 100 probably? Yep. Cool. Around $100, yeah. My question is, I had to scroll for a long time to get here because it seems like you're doing, now you're doing the daily videos from the interviews. That started eight months ago. Question number one, why are we not doing the question images anymore? And just to the benefit of the audiences, the, the videos, they still are questions, but they also have the video of the person answering the question. But is there a reason why we're not just doing the image with the question anymore? 
Okay, so it's a good question. I don't think I have a very good answer for you because you can still post something. I think we tried some questions somewhere in between. We are preparing a new format of content for our LinkedIn page, which will be discussions around books that are popular in the sphere and also some other stuff. So our videos, if they resonate with the audience, they get a lot of comments under them. So we definitely have videos that got dozens of shares and thousands of comments, but you don't want to... So we produce so much content, we never repurpose our content because we have more clips than we publish. So we have clips that are like a backup in case we don't have, but we produce more clips than we publish. So we don't want to overwhelm our audience and publish more than once a day. And I don't know a good answer to this question, like what is, how often should you publish on your page? But we stick to one post a day and we have enough of this content that also gives people food for thought. And if they don't agree, they do comment on our posts right? So it's still kind of the same, the discussion space for our audience. At least that's how I want that to be. Cool. Are you currently paying to promote the videos? Yes. So the original idea is that we pay for to boost our videos, right? But with time, we would pay less and less. Initially, I wanted to arrive at like that we don't even pay anything at all. And it would be just all organic. At this point, I'm not sure if that would be possible because we definitely have all these 8,000 people follow who follow our page. And if the content is great, our post gets a lot of engagement organically. Now, when we post on our page, we never boost immediately. It always sits there several days because this way we are able to see what's the organic performance, right? Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not great, which is understandable. It's like how all content works, right? You can't get great organic engagement if you post daily for every single post, but sometimes it blows up and we have a really great reach in these cases. But after several days, we add those paid support for our posts. And then with time, almost all our posts accumulate some engagement, right? More or less, but that's kind of the approach. I think that we will keep at least some budget, probably indefinitely, but I don't know, right? Things change. So we'll see about that. Nice. I think this is absolutely genius. And this is what I love about marketing is, I don't know, it's quite hard to explain, but how some, like everybody's really interested in something. And so if you can somehow as a brand, like tap into the thing that your customers are like super interested about and then allow them to either consume your information or even better, like give you or contribute information. That's just going to give your brand all this attention around the thing they're really interested in. And then if your product helps them like solve their problems, then that's how we make this profitable. And I think this is just like such a good example of doing that because it's super niche, right? It's like safety at work. So good. Is there anything we're missing from this strategy that you haven't told us? thing I wanted to add is the importance of the content production machine that I mentioned, because we produce so much content that we can publish daily. We have been publishing daily for since day one of the show without exceptions, and we will continue to do so. We have a bunch of shows recorded for the future days. And this has been such an important element Because if you really want to turn your marketing into this media kind of like project asset company, there has to be those processes that run smoothly, right? So to give you an idea what it is on how it looks on our side, we have a host for the show and we have a writer who actually 
watches the episodes and come up, the writer needs to come up with a title, right? Writes LinkedIn posts, show notes, and all that kind of stuff. Then we have a video editor and we have audio editing team. We have a marketing operations manager who runs all the processes and publishes some of the posts manually, some of them not manually, but we ensure that we have the all the processes running smoothly. This is a big, big part of doing this well, because if you don't have processes established, at some point, you will be overwhelmed by something else. You will get distracted. Then you will need an iron wheel to get back on track, which is not always possible. There could be, I don't know, like macroeconomical events that prevent you from doing something, anything. But because we have those established processes, no matter what happens, we just keep publishing. And that's, I think, also an advantage. You see some of the podcasts, some of the projects that happen in other companies, but you see so much inconsistency. So this has to be really, really done well. I mean, processes. This is super important. Mikhail, I've been writing notes and I've got six things I like about it this or like six, like almost like marketing lessons that you've implemented here that I just want to highlight for the audience. So the first is the kind of like outside the box genius thing that's really enabling your ideal customers to engage with each other. And as they do that, giving you attention through the LinkedIn algorithm. So that's the first thing. Second is, I think obviously there's a risk with building an audience or followership on someone else's platform. So your shift from doing that on the LinkedIn page to now having the RSS feed for the podcast, which I think is genius as well. Next is your strategy of like posting organically, seeing what gets traction, leaving it a couple of days, and then just boosting the ones that are getting traction is really intelligent. Next, you and your team obviously know the importance of like good systems and habits because you're totally right. If let's say you someone's off on holiday or you're really busy, you stop posting and then you lose all momentum. Next is your the focus on the ROI, like you guys saw that you were getting attention, but then no one really knew about slides. So you put in, and I saw this just now, like a three second clip at the end of every video, just to make sure everyone knows what slides is. And then finally, this may be the most genius, is if you really think about it, that whole strategy of the images was just a great guest sourcing approach for the podcast, right? So now you guys don't have to spend time or effort finding guests because you have them there on the LinkedIn page. So that's six things I like about this. This is exactly why I started this podcast, if to uncover like small niche, but very effective B2B marketing strategies. So I want to thank you for commenting on my post and enabling me to find this. And I want to thank you for your time and being so generous for sharing this with the world. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Everybody go and maybe you don't want to follow it because we don't want to mess up the follower ratio with like B2B marketers, but you can if you want. Slice on LinkedIn. And then if you just search for Mikhail Slice, I guess on Google, they'll probably be able to find your LinkedIn profile. Or is there anywhere else? Well, you have a podcast as well. I do. I do. Called Marketing with Ethics? It's called Ethics in Marketing. Ethics, ethics in Marketing. So everybody open the podcast app, don't Google, but write in <laughs> Ethics in Marketing and follow Mikhail's podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. To Mikhail, go check out Slice on LinkedIn to check out those video clips and to check out those images. If you have any feedback on the show, please go to Apple Podcasts, leave an honest rating or review. I read them all. I'll read them out on this show and I'll give you a shout out if you can do that. Finally, we must give a shout out to our awesome sponsor, H4F's Webmaster Tools. Google that. Go and get the tool for free. You just have to connect your Google Search Console and then you can get backlink tracking, SEO health, and keyword tracking for free. You don't have to pay anything. I do it for all my sites. Thank you so much for listening.